Okay, Audrey, I think we can um, put up our, our slides. Thank you everyone for, for joining us um, on this increasingly colder evenings that we're getting, uh, increasingly autumnal evenings. So thank you for taking the time to jo join us. Um, my name is Mary Claire Kennedy, and again, I'm facilitating um, this evening's webinar. And the topic that we're addressing this evening is with the Medicines Management Programme, an update on high-tech medicines and biosimilars. Um, just in terms of the domestics, um, I, I'm, we're all very well acquainted with um, online webinars now. Uh, so if you could keep your, your microphones muted as usual um, and have your videos on or off as you so wish. Um, if you're having any difficulties, leave it and rejoin. Um, but um, we have Audrey sitting here in the background as well who can help uh, if, if anybody's experiencing any particular issues. Uh, there's a chat box at the very bottom. If you hover over your screen, you can see the chat box and we'll allow time for questions at the end. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the website um, in the coming days and also we'll share a, a feedback survey as well towards the end of the session. So we'd appreciate any comments you have on this and on any other sessions you'd like to, to hear from us. Um, okay, so moving on to our speakers this evening. Um, thanks, Audrey. Um, so we're joined this evening by um, three different um, individuals from the Medicines Management Programme. Um, so Sarah Clark is Programme Manager, Bernard Duggan is Chief One Pharmacist and Rosalind Barrett Chief Two Pharmacist with the Medicines Management Programme. And um, sitting uh, as well with us is Stephen Dorn with the Medicines Management Programme, who may contribute to some questions towards the end as well. So without further ado, then I'll turn over to our speakers who will share their screen in a moment and we'll get underway. That's great, Sarah, I can see that, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. Um, Thank you so much for having us tonight and it's it's nice to be able to give an update on the work that we're doing and um, as um, Mary Claire already mentioned so I'm Sarah Clark and I've been with Medicine Madison program since 2013 and um, 2014 actually and um, we have Bernard and Rosen with us tonight but we are a team of um, of 10 people at the moment and um, number of pharmacists and we also have an epidemiologist um, working with us so um, it's just nice to be able to give you an opportunity I suppose to show some of the work that we're doing um, and give you a better understanding of it. Um, and now I slides are oh there you go good <laughs> um so the medicines management program was established in January 2013 so it'll be 10 years old um this coming January and it was set up with the aim to provide sustained national leadership relating to the safe effective and cost effective prescribing of medicines in Ireland um where we sit within the HSC I suppose um is useful to know in that we sit under the Chief Clinical Officer, Professor Colm Henry, and we are alongside a number of other uh, programmes, so the clinical uh, strategic programmes, uh, national cancer control programmes, screening services. And we have, I suppose, a very clear role in terms of um, providing clinical support and oversight um, in terms of a number of, of projects. Um, we work very closely with the national clinical programmes in different areas. So any if we're doing a review of any particular medicines, we would be linking in with the clinical programme related to that. And we also work very closely with the PCRS in terms of, I suppose, their remit is to manage the reimbursement um, of medicines. And we provide clinical support in terms of the appropriateness of reimbursement for different medicines and treatments. Um, and so that's sort of where we sit in and we, we would link in very regularly with um, clinicians and prescribers and I suppose maybe to a less extent maybe pharmacy and that's why it's really helpful for us to have this tonight. And so just to give a bit of a background in terms of the expenditure of medicines in Ireland so part of the reason the medicines management program was established in 2013 was that kind of in the 15 years previous, there was this huge increase in the expenditure on medicines. And that was a mix of a lot of new therapeutics coming to market. They were expensive. There was high volume, things like statins, PPIs. Um, and I suppose the state realized that there was going to be a requirement then to manage that in some respect. And things like reference pricing obviously had an impact, uh, but they wanted something sustained and long term. And that's why we were established. And so the expenditure has continued to increase over the years. And one of the areas that we see a huge area of increase, and you're probably aware of it yourself in, in pharmacy, is the high tech drug scheme. Um, a lot of the new medicines coming out are high tech medicines. Um, and so this would be is a graph of, I suppose, the expenditure. This isn't including fees, this is just the base. Uh, medicine fee as cost for and HSE. So in 2016, it was 
uh, 606 million euro and it went up in 2020 as high as um, 909 million million and we expect it I think in 2021 it was just below 1 billion and we expect it to have exceeded the 1 billion euro for 2022 and um, so this is a huge area really of focus um, for the HSE to try and put some management on it I suppose and, and, and be aware of where we're spending our money and that we're spending it appropriately. And so areas of interest to the MMP, just as a general information for yourselves, I suppose, we're always interested in frequently prescribed medicines. So uh, work we've done to focus in on frequently prescribed medicines is things like the preferred drug evaluation. We have prescribing cost guidance documents on inhalers for asthma and COPD. We've done reviews on benzodiazepines and Z drugs. And um, we have a recently published document on chronic um, on opiate use in chronic non-cancer pain. And um, we're also always interested in oral nutrition supplements because we spend a lot on those. And obviously the DOACs over the years, both for their safety, um, their risk, um, and also the expenditure. And then generic prescribing is also you know, very important to us. Um, and then we have some things that are in place for a number of years now in terms of reimbursement application systems for those high volume items where the expenditure um, didn't really match the clinical evidence that we expected. So things like Versatis, the orange supplements and Entresto, we manage those um, regularly as well. We're also very interested in, high, in the most expensive medicines. And this is where I suppose Bernard will speak to about um, the high tech drug scheme and biosimilars and what we have done to try and manage the expenditure on those high cost medicines. And I suppose, and we hope that that uh, process will continue. So Bernard will speak about that in a couple of minutes. And then also then as new medicines are coming to the reimbursement list, they are more and more the rare diseases, high cost medicines. And so we have an interest in this area because the HSC tends to want management around these new medicines to manage their expenditure. And so what we call is health technology management is how we um, support the HSE in, I suppose, paying for the appropriate medicines for the most uh, people. And where we get our remit for this work is from the Health Act 2013, um, part four, section 20. So that outlines that the HSE, the executive, may attach conditions to the supply of listed items in the interest of one or more of the following. So patient safety, cost effectiveness, maximizing the appropriate use of a listed item um, or appropriately applying the resources available to the, to the executive. And so without, within any of the work that we do, we would come in under kind of mostly C and D for ourselves and the NCP is involved in the cost effectiveness side. So this is a little bit busy, but basically, I suppose, you know, the question is, how do we deal with the challenge of new high cost drugs looking for reimbursement in Ireland? So the standard process that is now in a, when a product receives its marketing authorization, um, it may, and it wants to, it wants to launch in Ireland, it will put a pricing application into the HSE um, and the HSE will then generally if, if the price is very low, they may actually just approve it uh, if it's cheaper than what's already there. But if they want to assess it, they will ask the National Centre for Pharmacoeconomics to conduct either a rapid review, which is a short review, or a full health technology assessment to assess the cost effectiveness of a medicine. And the NCPE will then make that recommendation to the HSE, to Drugs Group and Leadership. And generally, more and more, their recommendation is sorry there's a little bit of feedback coming through there sorry and um, their recommendation is that it will be added to the reimbursement list or it may not be added to the reimbursement list but more and more frequently they're saying add it to the reimbursement list um, but with a managed access approach. So therefore they're saying maybe it's for a specific group of patients, a specific cohort where cost effectiveness has been established, but not, I suppose, a free for all. Um, and so that's where we have come in in the last number of years. Um, and since I suppose the, we've really started the managed access um, piece and the health technology management piece since about 2019. Um, so within that, we, I suppose, we have our already established some reimbursement application systems, but the two things we'll talk about tonight um, or the managed access processes, which is where we have a specific process in place for high cost medicines that the HSC wants to reimburse, but for specific patients. And then looking at the best value biological medicines, and that's the way to make that space for new medicines um, and the work that we've done in, in that area. And really, I suppose that leads in, you know, um, how do we find the money to make to allow these new medicines to be reimbursed when we're spending more and more money every year and really we have to do that we have to find new ways um, of saving money in medicines that are already prescribed and dispensed um, and making space for, for funding of new medicines so with that I'll um, 
lead on to, to Bernard. Uh, so Bernard's going to go through, um, I suppose, all of the work that has been done in terms of the, uh, the biosimilar medicines and um, the biologics. That's Sarah. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about the area of work in biosimilar medicines, which has been a focus of the work of the MMP uh, for the last number of years. I'm briefly going to talk about biological medicines and biosimilar medicines, what they are, um, the expenditure on biological medicines, and then our best value biological medicine initiative that we've undertaken for Adelaide Babi Tanner So let's see if I um Sorry, got on one slide too many there. Just have an issue sharing the screen here. So if we look, um, uh, if we go back a number of years to the PCRS annual report in 2006, and I know some people are probably getting a bit anxious and getting beads of sweat on their foreheads as the structures on the slide takes them back to their days of chemistry in college and schools. But the medicines with the highest expenditure on the community drug schemes back in 2006 were atorvastatin, omeprazole, pravastatin, so our PPIs and our statins. And these are all, as we can see, chemically based medicines. They're small molecules, and nowadays they will be thought to have a simple structure. We know how to make them. They have a single defined structure. There's no variability. They're made by a predictable chemical reaction, so we can make an identical copy of them. So they're easy to fully characterize their structure. So once the patent expires, generics can be made, which are exact copies. And those generics have to undertake pharmacokinetic studies to show that they've equivalent bioavailability. And then we have licensed generic versions of these chemical medicines. And as Sarah said earlier, the Health Pricing and Supply of Medical Goods Act 2013 has allowed for lists of interchangeable medicines and reference pricing. And it's been a cost con containment measure that has helped to reduce the cost of these medicines. A lot of the new medicines that are coming on now are biological medicines. And a biological medicine is a product, the active substance of which is produced, for, uh, the active substance of which is produced by or extracted from a biological source or a biological substance. And these are things like insulin, erythropoietin, follicle stimulating hormone, and all the monoclonal antibodies with, that we're now aware of, things like adalimab and etanercept. And these are all made to fit a desired target. So for example, adalimumab targets TNF-alpha in the body. These are all very large molecules. They're 100 to 1,000 times larger than the medicines that we spoke about earlier, the chemical ones like atorvastatin, pravastatin, pantoprazole. And then rather than being made by chemical methods, they are made, biological medicines are made from one of four living systems, so bacteria, yeast, fungi. Because of this, the active substance in the biological medicine has an inherent degree of variability. And the manufacturing of the biological medicine has many multiple complex steps, and each of these has, a, has impact on the final structure of the biological medicine. So because of the inherent variability of the active substance and the manufacturing process, all biological medicines exhibit some degree of variation, and even between batches of the same product. So if you've been on Humira for 10 to 15 years, the Humira you're, you're on now isn't going to be the exact same as the Humira that you were on 10 years ago because it's not possible to make an exact copy of a biological medicine, be it the originator of biological medicine or a biosimilar. But what's in place are strict controls and limits in the manufacturing process, which minimize the variability and ensure that any variability does not affect the safety and efficacy of biological medicines. And it was this process that the EMA had in place for managing the variability in biological medicines that ultimately led to the, to the licensing process for biosimilar medicines. So if we then come forward to look at the PCRS annual report in 2021, the medicines now with the highest expenditure are now biological medicines. So things like adalimumab, etanercept, also ostekinumab. So we've switched from chemical medicines, chemical-based medicines with high expenditure now to biological medicines. And as you see from the slide, they have a very different structure to the chemical-based medicines. They're proteins with primary, secondary, tertiary structures. So they're much more complicated, much larger, much more intricate, intricate than the chemical-based medicines. If we look at the high-tech arrangement um, in 2021 and the items that we had the highest expenditure, um, the top 20 items accounted for 567 million of the 919 million expenditure that Sarah mentioned earlier. So that's about just under 60% of the total expenditure. 
And if we look at those top 20 items, nine of them are biological medicines, accounting for expenditure of over 300 million. And then if we then look at those nine medicines, we currently have biosimilar medicines available for four of those. And very shortly in the next year or two, we're going to have biosimilar medicines for a further two. So of the nine, not for nine of the top 20 medicines and the high-tech arrangement are biological medicines. And we have, or are shortly going to have biosimilar versions of six of those very shortly. And biosimilar medicines have potential economic benefit to the health system. They provide the opportunity to continue to provide the biological medicine to the patient, but at a reduced cost. And as Sarah said earlier, this can lead to increased access to medicines for patients, both in terms of the biological medicine itself, in that the lower cost of the medicine may move its position in the treatment pathway for patients. So you, more, you may get more patients being treated with that particular medicine. But also because we're reducing the cost arising from the funding of reimbursed medicines, we're creating that headspace in the drug budget to provide access to new innovative medicines for patients. So a biosimilar medicine is a close copy of an authorized biological medicine, but it's not a generic. We know that generics from the previous slides have the exact same qualitative and quantitative composition as the originator medicine. But biosimilar medicines are essentially the same as the refer reference biological medicine, but with minor differences in the active substance because of that inherent variability that's there, but with the biological medicine and the manufacturing process. But they are highly similar in all essential aspects to the reference medicine, I suppose, in terms of quality, safety and efficacy. So they're a biological medicinal product that contains a version of an active substance of a medicinal product that's already authorized in the EU, the reference medicine. So for example, the reference medicine is Humira, and we have a wide variety of biosimilar medicines of Humira, um, Amjavita, Imralgi, Julio, Edasio, et cetera, that are available. When the biosimilar medicine is licensed, it has to demonstrate that it is very similar to the reference medicine in terms of quality, safety, and efficacy, and that there's no clinically meaningful differences. So it has to establish similarity to the key characteristics of the biological activity of the reference medicine. It's not assumed to be identical to the biological medicine, it's a biosimilar version. A comparability exercise is done against the reference medicine. There's a full characterization exercise. The physiochemical properties are examined. There's a pharmacokinetic study, and there's typically one phase three equivalent study to show that there's no difference in terms of the efficacy of the medicine compared with the, with the reference biological medicine. And the EMA allows the range of variability for the biosimilar medicine in comparison to the reference medicine, as similar to that which is allowed for batches between batches of the reference medicine. And as of last month, there is more than 70 biosimilar medicines licensed by the European Commission. So if we look at the biosimilar medicines that are available on the community drug schemes, we have nine biological medicines that we now have biosimilar medicines available. So we have one biosimilar with Repuitin, we have a number of biosimilar filgrastrum, which is your granulocyte colony stimulating factor that's used for the treatment of neutropenia um, in chemotherapy patients as long, uh, in, along with other indications. We have two biosimilar medicines of phytropin alpha, which is used for in vitro fertilization. We have three biosimilar medicines of teriparatide, which is used in the treatment of severe osteoporosis. We have one insulin biosimilar. We have two etanercept biosimilars, which are used um, in dermatology and rheumatology. We have six adalimumab biosimilars, which are used by gastroenterology, rheumatology, and dermatology. We have a biosimilar version of pegfilgrastrum, which is used in the treatment to uh, prevent neutropenia in patients on certain types of chemotherapy. And recently, we now have one uh, subcutaneous infliximab biosimilar, which is available on the community drug schemes. So within the MMP, what we've been focusing on the last number of years is biosimilar versions of etanercept and adalimumab, and our best value biological medicine initiative has focused on those. So I'm going to talk about the work that we've done in relation to these medicines. And you've probably know, and I know from the feedback we got in the questions that were circulating with the registration, a lot of people have noticed a, quite an, an uplift in the prescribing of these biosimilar medicines in comparison to the originator products. So if we go back to 2017, in terms of adalimumab, our total expenditure on that medicine was just over 137 million, with about 10,300 unique patients accessing adalimumab on the high-tech arrangement in 2017. And at that stage, we only had the originator medicine available for adalimumab, Humira. Uh, Etanercept, we spent just under 56 million on the high-tech arrangement in 2017, with just under 7,000 unique patients accessing it. 
And at that stage, we did have biosimilar versions of etanercept on the high tech arrangement since November 2016. When we look at 2017 as a whole, even though we had biosimilar versions of etanercept available since November 2016, the considerable amount of the utilization and expenditure still remained with the reference medicine Embril. So 99.5% utilization and expenditure were on Embril with only very limited handful of utilization of Benapali, which was the biosimilar product. And I suppose there was a lost opportunity there in terms of the potential savings that were available to the HSE arising from the funding of this medicine. I suppose the important point, to, another point to note is that biological medicines have been specifically precluded from, from being, designated in, um, been designated on a list of interchangeable medicines by the HPRA through the Health Act. So for a prescriber to, for a patient to be initiated or switched to one of the biosimilar medicines, the prescriber would have to make the decision to prescribe the biosimilar medicine for that patient and issue them with a prescription for that medicine. So if the, if the decision would rest with the prescriber. So at that stage through 2017 up to 2018, we were still, we were getting very little utilization of biosimilar medicines. Um, in late 2018, leader, HSE leadership asked us to look at the issue of biosimilar medicines and particularly to focus on adalimumab and etanercept. We undertook a process where we, ident we looked at the biosimilar medicines and the reference medicines that were available for both of these products, for both of these medicines, and we um, identified what we termed best value biological medicines. We had a variety of criteria that we looked at. Um, Obviously, cost was important, but we considered other factors like the range of indications of each product, the various presentations that were available to allow administration to different patients, the patient support programs that were in place by each from each of the marketing authorization holders, because these are all self-administered injection devices, so patients would require support in doing that. Um, we published our evaluation report in May 2019. And in that, we recommended our best value biological medicines, or essentially our preferred products for adalimumab and etanercept um, for prescribers to, to, to choose when prescribing these agents for patients. So we had clear, clearly identified our products in May 2019. At that stage, we had two preferred agents for adalimumab and one, one preferred agent for etanercept. We've since expanded, conducted further reviews as more products have come to market. And we now have six preferred agents or best value biological medicines for adalimumab, that being Amdivita, Idacio, Julio, Imraldi, Hiramaz, and Euphlima. And we have two preferred agents for Etanercept, Benapali, and Arelzi. And I suppose we would have gotten feedback from clinicians at the time that even though we could have just gone with one product, they still wanted the op they still wanted a choice of products for patients. And that allows for in some patients who have a particular problem with a device or if they're experiencing an adverse drug reaction because of a particular formulation, the option is there to try them on another product. I suppose a key point, one of the key points is that the best the identified preferred products are best value, value biological medicines cost substantially less than the originator products. So by prescribing, dispensing, and using the identified BVB medicines, this is leading to significant savings for the health service in the order of millions of euros. And that's again, creating the headspace for access to new innovative treatments. So in terms of, we identified our best value biological medicines in for adalim, adalimab and etanercept in May, 2019. And then we moved to work with um, clinical teams in terms of implementation. So the first thing we did was develop a suite of resources for healthcare professionals. And these are available in a dedicated section on our website, the best value medicine section, which then has a section on the best value biological medicines. And this section contains all the information on our best value biological medicines, and it has a variety of resources to support healthcare professionals. We have a questions and answer document that we update regularly. We have product developed product information sheets for each of our best value biological medicines. And this just, these go through the best value biological, each of the products. They talk about how the various, um, how each should be administered, the storage conditions. And it also mentions any nuances in terms of similarities and differences between the reference medicine. So if you have a patient who's being switched from one of the originator products to one of these, just things that you need to, that you might want to think about telling the patient about. And these are for all clinical teams and they're also accessible to pharmacists and they might be helpful things to look at in your practice. We have information on the patient support programs and how to access them for each of our preferred products. And we have other resources that probably are more prescriber specific in terms of template for switching letters. We also have copies of all the communications that we've issued to prescribers in relation to the Best Value Biological Medicine Initiative on our, on our website. 
Um, the high tech, we, we, we moved to implement the best value biological medicines in June 2019. And this coincided with the deployment of the high tech hub to the specialities of dermatology, gastroenterology, and rheumatology, who would be the cohort of prescribers who, were, who are prescribing adalimum and etanercept. And I suppose the high tech hub has acted as a useful tool in terms of supporting the prescribing of the BVB medicines. Um, it, when the prescriber goes in to use the high tech hub, the BVB medicines are clearly designated on the hub as BVB medicines, so they're readily identifiable. When you're prescribing a biological medicine, it's very important um, and it would be recommended by the medicines regulators that they're prescribed by both the INN and the brand name because of pharmacovigilance and traceability and the high tech hub supports that. And also we've done some work with the clinicians in terms of building in a pre-populated patient support program registration form into the hub for the first time a patient is prescribed one of the preferred agents. We've done a lot of work in terms of engaging with the national clinical programs for dermatology, gastroenterology, rheumatology, and the clinical leads for those three programs have really acted as change champions in terms of in terms of encouraging their colleagues to support this initiative, but also for doing it on the ground themselves in their own hospitals and for giving us feedback on what's going well and maybe what we need to think about in terms of modif modifying the process. And that's been very helpful as we've rolled out to various hospitals around the country. We have done a good bit of engagement with patient support groups, and I'll talk about that in a few slides time. We also have done site visits. So in conjunction with the High Tech Coordination Unit, we have done information sessions to the three, to gastroenterology, rheumatology, and dermatology teams in their hospitals nationally, where we've done an information, the High Tech Hub provided an information session on the use of the hub. And we've talked to the prescribers about the BVB medicines um, and how we can support them in prescribing them and increasing their uptake. So we were doing those site visits, visiting hospitals until COVID came along. And in the last number of, in the last two years, we've been doing a lot of them online, but we're starting to go back out to hospitals again now. Um, we saw from other countries that have been early adopters of biosimilar medicines that gain share arrangements have worked to help support their utilization. So a prescribing incentive was put in place when the BVB um, process was implemented for adalimumab and Tanercept where a proportion of the savings that were generated from the prescribing of the BVB medicine were made available back to the clinical team who were responsible for generating that saving for the, for the enhancement of their service for the benefit of patients. And we've seen uh, some excellent projects been undertaken at, at local level and hospital in the three clinical settings um, in order to develop their services for patients. In February 2020, we had uh, got approval from HC uh, executive management team for a policy that all new patients who were starting treatment uh, for the first time with adalimumab or etanercept should be initiated on one of our preferred agents. We had done our evaluation, we had identified our preferred agents, and they were the most cost effective option for patients. So that policy has been in place since February 2020. And we have uh, support material on our website, both for patients and prescribers in relation to that. And we've engaged in regular communication with prescribers, both formally in terms of writing them to update them on the VVB process and to provide updates on their utilization. And also informally, we regularly get communications from clinical teams, both uh, prescribers, clinical nurse specialists, um, AMPs working in clinical services, asking for support with um, queries in terms of switching and in relation to the BVB, BVB medicines. So we're constantly engaging with prescribers in relation to this initiative. Um, as I said, we've done some work with patient support groups. So in conjunction with the Irish Society for Colitis and Crohn's and the National Clinical Programme for Gastroenterology, we developed a biosimilar patient information leaflet that's specific for patients in gastroenterology. And that can be obtained from the ISCC, but it's also available to download from our, from our website in the Best Value Biological Medicines section. And we've also done work with Arthritis Ireland in terms of developing a biosimilar specific section on their website. So if you have a patient who's been started on a biosimilar be it for a gastroenterology or a rheumatology patient, these might be very useful resources to signpost them to. I suppose just to look at where we are now in terms of the uptake of our biosimilar medicines, um, if you go, if you look at the left hand side of the graph, the blue line represents the number of patients that are on Humira, and the red line represents the number of patients that are on our BVB medicines. So if we go back to the left hand side to June 2019, even though we had biosimilar medicines on the high tech arrangement since November 20. November 2018, by June 2019, we were seeing very little utilization of them, 
with about 8,000 patients on Adalimumab 40 on a monthly basis on the high-tech arrangement, and the vast majority of those on Humira. We moved to implement our recommendations in June 2019, and since then we've seen a considerable shift in prescribing and dispensing practices, with now um, just under 9,000 patients on one of our BVB medicines um, on the right-hand side there in, June, in July 2022, and just under 3,000 patients remaining on Humira. And in terms of percentage uptake, um, as you can see in June 2019, represented on the left-hand side by the blue bar, we were at 98% Humira. And as of July 2022, on the right-hand side, we now have just over 76% of patients who are accessing one of our preferred agents, one of our BVB medicines, and about 24% of patients who remain on Humira. And we have been in contact with prescribers recently, again, just to try and encourage further to, to, to once again review those patients who are on Humira and Embril and ask them to switch to consider them for switching to one of our preferred agents. Again, it's a similar story with the Tanercept. <clears throat> if you go to the left hand side, even though we had biosimilary Tanercept available since June 2016, um, we had very little uptake of it, 4,000 patients on, just, just over 4,000 patients at that stage on Etanercept, majority of those on Embril. And if we come forward to July 2022, um, just over 3,000 patients as represented by the red line are on one of our preferred BVB medicines with just under 1,500 patients on Embril. And again, in percentage terms, as of July 22, to July, July this year, we just have over about 68% of patients who are on one of our BVB medicines and about 32% of patients who remain on Embril. And again, we're, in, we're, we're just trying to further encourage switching of those patients to one of our preferred agents. So I suppose we would have been seen prior to this as probably a country that we're very reticent about using biosimilars. But now it's been noted at a European level that we've seen quite a rapid uptake of biosimilar medicines in the last number of years. And I think we've also seen a real shift in opinion among prescribers that there's now an appetite and a recognition of the value of biosimilar medicines in terms of the overall, in terms of the overall access to medicines on the drug budget. We publish each January the list of medicines, list of medicines that we might, um, that we may look at in terms of biosimilar medicines. So this is the list we published in January of this year. We have done a considerable amount of work on teriparatide, um, which is used in the treatment of severe osteoporosis. And we're shortly hoping to issue our recommendation in relation to our preferred agent for that. And we're just at the moment um, in the middle of our evaluation process for the two granulocyte Connolly simulated factors, filgrastrum and peg filgrastrum. And uh, once we finish our evaluation process, we'll be recommending our best value biological medicines for those two biological medicines. Um, I think one thing of interest to note was last week, the European Medicines Agency and the head of Medicines Agency issued a joint statement in relation to biosimilar medicines. And essentially their statement confirmed that biosimilar medicines that are approved in the EU are interchangeable with their reference medicine or with an equivalent biosimilar when that, that decision is made by a prescriber. Um, so uh, essentially interchangeability in this context means using one medicine instead of another with the same therapeutic intent. So essentially what they were saying that was that this decision that the prescriber makes is to prescribe adalimumab. And after that, once if there are biological medicines, reference biological medicines like Humira, or if there are biosimilar medicines available in the EU, any one of those can be selected. And the European Medicines Agency, as the person who reviews the quality, safety and efficacy of those medicines, has decided that they would expect all those to have the same effect. And I suppose this was very interesting because previously there was no agreed harmonised position across the EU in terms of interchangeability for biosimilars. When a biosimilar medicine is licensed, the study that's undertaken is against the, the reference medicine. So there's been no phase three studies comparing one biosimilar with another to show one biosimilar of adalimumab with another biosimilar of adalimumab to show that they're comparable. But the EMA now, now consider that based on all the scientific evidence that they have available, um, both in terms of efficacy and in particular in relation to safety and immunogenicity, that they are happy that once approved any additional switch studies don't, aren't required in terms of biosimilars, so that once we have biosimilar versions of adalimumab, any of the adalimumab products can be prescribed, and the EMA say that they all have, they all have the similar um, safety, quality, and efficacy, and that there's no clinically meaningful differences between any of them. 
So I suppose we've seen a lot of work in terms of biosimilars in the last number of years, and it's an area that we're going to continue to focus on in, in the medicines management program, because as Sarah alluded to earlier, it's one of those things where we can influence current prescribing behavior to try and create the headspace to free up the, to free up the drug budget to provide access to new medicines. So I'm now going to hand back over to Sarah, and I think Thanks, she's going to talk about the manage access protocols and processes that we have in place for a variety of medicines. That's great. Thanks, Bert. I took back the controls there. Um, great. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks, Bert, for that. It's yeah. It's, it's really, it's really good for us to see. I suppose work on medicines that have been around for a long time, and that we can still, you know, make changes and 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 impact. And I suppose now we'll move on to and Rosie will will go into this in more detail. I'll just give you a brief introduction. Is um, manage access protocols, and this is really, I suppose where we've now started as new medicines come on the processes that have been put in place in recent years to um i suppose to to get the the, the most uh, the most medicines to the right patients and that's really what we're trying to do so on our website we have a list of all of the managed access protocols that we undertake and um, some are hospital based and um, these ones i've highlighted here are um high-tech medicines and so community pharmacy based and um, and i suppose this all of these really have been uh, done since 2018 um, 2019 so it's all very new and a lot of work i suppose has gone into the development of these and um, the three new ones that we're expecting to come in the next couple of months are inotercin so inotercin is for stage two uh, one and two polyneuropathy with amyloidosis um, we currently have a hospital medicine for this um, treatment, but this would be a, um, a different, I suppose, a high-tech high -tech medicine. Rivaroxaban, uh, 2.5 milligram twice daily. So this will be, I suppose, a, um, a new reimbursement application system separate to the old one that was there for the DOAX. This is because Rivaroxaban 2.5 milligram twice daily is for use with aspirin for the prevention of atherothrombotic events in people with C, uh, coronary artery disease or peripheral artery disease. And I suppose the potential here, there could be a very very large number of patients and so the hse wished that it would be managed in an appropriate way that the right patients would get access to those um, that are suitable for treatment and then a better colic acid and um, would be in the next couple of months and that is for primary biliary cholangitis and um, and so the ones that we'll kind of i suppose focus on and, and rosie will have will have a bit of a discussion around so cgrp mabs are ones you might have seen in the last 12 to 18 months and um, treatments for chronic migraine we've seen um, a high volume of increase um, in applications for that for that clinical area and the pcsk9 inhibitors have been around for quite a while now and um, maybe with a little bit less um applications for them but alirocumab and avalocumab would be ones you'd have seen and then the treatments for atopic dermatitis so it starts with uh, dupixent dupilumab but we now have four uh, treatments there and I'll, I'll hand over to Rosine um, and she's just going to go through I suppose the way in which that process has worked and um, as using atopic dermatitis as an example but pretty much all of our maps run in a similar way um, to that so um, hopefully Rosine you have controls there. I think you do and um, so I'll hand over to Rosine. So thanks for that, Sarah. Um, as mentioned, my name is Rosalind Barrett. I'm another one of the pharmacists with the Medicines Management Programme. And I'm just going to give you a short presentation on managed access protocols and medicines on the high-tech arrangement that are associated with managed access protocols. Um, so as we've already discovered, the MMP are responsible for the implementation and oversight for several different managed access protocols. And these can all be viewed on our website, the managed access protocols are in place for a number of different drugs for several different indications, and the number of drugs which are subject to managed access protocols are likely to increase as time goes on. So drugs which are currently available subject to a managed access protocol that you are most likely to see dispensed through the high tech arrangement are listed on this slide. Um, so first off, there are the calcitonin and gene related peptide monoclonal antibodies, the CGRP maps, and these have been available since April 2022 for the treatment of chronic migraine. So there are three different agents available under this map. The first is Irenumab, that's available as the brand Amovig. Um, there's also Freemonizumab, which is probably the one that you would see most commonly, branded AJOV, and Galcanizumab, which is available as Engality. The second group are the pro-protein converted subtilicin kexin type 9 inhibitors, so the PCSK9 inhibitors, and they've been available since 2019. And there are two different agents available under this managed access protocol, alirocumab, which is branded Praluent, and Evolocumab, which is branded Repatha. 
Um, the third group that you probably see quite a few of recently are for the treatment of atopic dermatitis. Um, and they include abrocitinib, dupilumab, tralokinumab, and upadacitinib. And I will speak about all of these in a little bit more detail later on in the presentation. Um, so why do we have managed access to medicines? Well, the MMP establish and implement managed access protocols based on guidance from the HSE Drugs Group. So the HSE Drugs Group and HSE Leadership are the people who make the recommendations as to whether drugs should be reimbursed via community drug schemes or not. So they can say, yes, it should be reimbursed. No, it shouldn't be. Or yes, it should be reimbursed, but subject to specific conditions. And this third cohort is where the MMP and managed access protocols come in. Um, generally speaking, managed access protocols are recommended for high budget impact drugs. So those are drugs which just cost a lot of money. And that's usually either because they're frequently prescribed or because they're expensive, or it could be a combination of both of those factors. So you can see a couple of examples on this slide. Um, I won't dwell too much on the detail, but you can see from the last column that all of these drugs have a high budget impact, which could potentially cost the state millions of euro over the course of five years. Um, some of the drugs are expensive. So if you look at the first line, lanadelumab, for example, when this drug is used at the higher dosing regimen, it costs 471,000 per patient per year. Um, and even though the expected patient numbers are quite low, the potential budget impact over five years is still high at over 15 million. Um, you can see then on the third line that the potential budget impact for dupilumab is higher at 50 million, but the cost per patient is 19,000, so less per patient per year. So this drug is expensive and expects high patient numbers. Um, then we have other drugs that are subject to managed access that are comparatively less expensive. So if you look at rivaroxaban and aspirin there on the last line, um, this costs less than 1,000 per patient per year, but with thousands of patients expected to access this treatment over five years, the potential budget impact is quite significant at 46.2 million. So if all of these drugs were reimbursed, they could potentially cost nearly 150 million over five years. So that's the basis for why we have managed access. Um, so I'm just going to talk through one of the managed access protocols specifically. Um, so all of the agents on this slide are for the treatment of atopic dermatitis and are accept accessible on the high-tech arrangement subject to a managed access protocol. So the first agent added was dupilumab, um, and it's probably the most frequently prescribed out of this um, group of medicines. It's marketed as the brand Dupixent, and it was added originally in April 2021 as the prefill pen, and then a month later, the prefill syringe was also brought to market. Um, then after that, upadacitinib was added to the protocol um, for this indication in February 2022 under the brand name Rinvoke. Um, and I am aware that this product is also available on the high tech arrangement for other indications, but in the context of this presentation and this managed access protocol, we're only speaking about its use in dermatology for the indication of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Um, the next drug added was tralokinumab, and that's branded at Tralza, and that was added in March 2022. And then most recently in July 2022, abrocitinib was added as the brand Sabinco. So all the specific details about the prescribing of these drugs are contained in the managed access protocol, and you can see a picture of that there on the slide. Um, the full document is available on the website. Um, it's important to note that the managed access protocol is an evidence-based document, um, and it's been informed by HSE drugs group guidance, by clinical trials, and by best practice guideline, guidelines. Um, along with that, while the MMP were developing the managed access protocol, they engaged with the National Clinical Programme for Dermatology. So these are an expert group of HSE dermatologists. And when the managed access protocol was finalised, both the MMP and the National Clinical Programme were happy to proceed with um, the map with its terms as they were set out. Um, so firstly, the map contains information about the criteria that must be satisfied for reimbursement. It also outlines that in order to prescribe medicines, you need to be a specific approved prescriber. So all consultant dermatologists are eligible to be approved prescribers. And it also highlights that approval is granted on an individual patient basis. So that just means that an application must be submitted on behalf of each individual patient. So this slide here outlines the reimbursement criteria. So the first criteria is age. Um, so all four of the agents outlined in the managed access protocol 
may be recommended for reimbursement in adults, but in line with the licensing requirements, only dupilumab and upadacitinib, upadacitinib may be recommended for the adolescent population. Um, the patient must also have an established diagnosis of atopic dermatitis. So for adult patients, that's a diagnosis made at least three years before the application. And for the adolescent subgroup, that's a diagnosis that was made at least one year before. The patient must also have atopic dermatitis of at least moderate severity. And that's demonstrated by something called their easy score. So the easy score is the eczema area severity index score. And it's a clinician reported score in which a doctor assesses the skin and determines severity based on a scale of zero to 72. So anything that's 16 or higher indicates at least moderate severity. The next point is about previous immunosuppressant treatment. Um, so this refers to one of four agents from the standard of care for atopic dermatitis that you'll all be familiar with. Um, so they are azathioprine, cyclosporin, methotrexate and mycophenolate. Um, and as per the drugs group guidance, immunosuppressant treatment must have failed. So that is that the patient had an inadequate response to a trial of one of those medicines that the treatment must not be tolerated. So that's that the patient had a clinically significant adverse reaction to one of them, or there must be a contraindication to the immunosuppressant medicine. And then along with all of those above points, the patient must also be in receipt of what's called best supportive care. So that's things like emollients, topical corticosteroids, and topical calcineurin inhibitors. So as mentioned, you need to be an approved prescriber to make an application for reimbursement. Um, and at present, we have 58 approved prescribers who are located across the country in eight geographical locations um, in 24 separate sites. So consultant dermatologists can sign up to be an approved prescriber at any point. They just need to contact the MMP to do so. So to make an application on behalf of each individual patient, um, the approved prescriber must make an application through the application form. And um, this is currently a paper-based system and the application form that you see here must be completed and submitted to the medicines management group. Um, generally high volume medicines like Tepilumab and the other atopic dermatitis medicines have an online system. Um, and this system is coming for Tepilumab, um, but it's not up and running yet. But regardless of whether it's paper-based system or an online application system, if the patient's approved for treatment, the approval will be linked to the patient's PPSN and their community drug scheme number. And this will be visible on the secure scheme checker. So drugs which are subject to a managed access protocol are identifiable to community pharmacists on the high-tech hub. So there is a current and up-to-date list of hub drugs on the appendix section of the FAQ section on the hub. So you can access that through going via the help tab. Um, and on this list, drugs which are subject to a managed access protocol are identified as you can see on screen. So with the little asterisks and map in brackets. Um, and you'll also have visibility of whether a particular patient is approved via the patient specific arrangements on the secure scheme checker. Um, and as of the beginning of this week, the MMP had received 536 applications. Um, the majority of the applications have been approved, 94% um, are approved. So we have over 500 approved patients at the moment. The majority of applications that are submitted are for Dupilumab, but all the other agents have been added more recently. So it is quite possible that uptake will improve um, for those other agents as time goes on. And that brings me to the end of my slides. So thank you all for your attention. Um, and I might ask Sarah to come back in. Yeah. Thank you, Rosalie. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, so just uh, very briefly, I suppose, before we finish up, just to let you know that um, all of the information we've discussed to, to this evening is on our website. So www.hse.ie forward slash your medicines. And you see the drop down list there in the section. So the best value biological medicines are there at the top. Um, and then we have a specific section for managed access protocols. And um, all of the other things that we do are also in there and um, different things under preferred drugs, prescribing tips and tools and um, 
different information and publications that you might find helpful. But I suppose in, in terms of what we discussed tonight, those two sections are there specifically. Um, and that's really, that's really, I suppose it was a bit of a whistle stop tour, maybe in terms of just trying to bring you up to speed in some of the work that we do. And um, as I say, we're a team of, of, of 10 at the moment. We have um, a lot of, uh, you know, pharmacists working on different projects. It's not just, just ourselves here tonight. Um, and, you know, it's really helpful when we have good engagement with other with other um, healthcare professionals. So it's really uh, delighted to be here tonight. So if you have any questions or um, our email address are there, my own email address and the MMP at HTC.ie comes into the team as well. So if, if something comes to you at a later date as well, we'd be happy to uh, take questions. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so um, if, please feel free to use the chat box um, below at the bottom of your screen to type in some questions um, if you have any. So we're after receiving one question um, and it's about, um, apologies for my pronunciation of all these in advance, you, you guys are, are whizzes on it, <laughs> about a betacolic acid, um, Ocalvia, that you mentioned, is, is it due to become a managed access drug? So yes, yeah, so a betacolic acid is is to become a managed access uh, treatment. We have currently we're we're finalising all the work with the HSE um, for it to be made available. So it will be uh, we've managed access protocol, and we will have specific details for prescribers um, to apply for reimbursement. And we've engaged with the clinical program in relation to that. And actually, for the moment, we're just waiting for the company to have a date when they are ready to launch the product so it probably will be in the in the coming months um so once it is ready for reimbursement we it will put information up on the website so i suppose it, it'll probably for best colic acid we're envisaging the next couple of months at this stage great thank you um a question about the gain share for the BV, bvv program i think bernard you mentioned that you're on mute there bernard yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the gain share program, it, it's something that's been done in lots of other countries. Um, and I think one of the prime, there was a prime example um, in Southampton in the early days of switching infliximab biosimilars, Southampton Hospital, and um, infliximab biosimilars, biosimilars in gastroenterology patients. And I suppose it was in recognition of the work that clinical teams put in, in terms of counseling patients, switching them over from one product to another, um, patients doing the patients, registering for new patient support programs, talking to the patients about biosimilar medicines. There's a well-recognized thing called the nocebo effect, which um, is essentially that you know, by switching from one medicine, one version of medicine to another, that patients will have and an, 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 perceive themselves to have an adverse reaction that really isn't there. So a, a lot of work goes into switching the patients, a lot of counseling, communication and time from the prescribers. So in recognition of that and seeing what was done in other health systems, we recommended that that consideration should be given to putting some sort of prescribing incentive or gain share arrangement in place so that clinical teams could benefit from some of the savings within their own services. So when prescribers go in and they have to use the high tech hub for this, because I suppose the high tech hub allows us to clearly identify the prescriber and the site, which the service and site which in which they're working and prescribing the BVB medicine. So when they go in and prescribe um, the BVB medicine for a patient for the first time, um, when they switch the patient to it, that's logged on the, the, the high tech hub. And the gain share arrangement, which is 500 euro per patient, is made available to that particular service within that hospital. And uh, at any point then, since the, since the program has been initiated, the hospital can submit a request to draw down their gain share. And a wide variety of, I suppose, service enhancements and projects have been undertaken. I know quite a big uh, um, renovation project has part, been partly funded in the rheumatology service in Connolly Hospital out in Blanchestown. Um, in terms of their gain share arrangement. I know other sites have bought particular equipment um, for, their, for their service, be it an ultrasound or something in rheumatology. So there's been lots of different projects that have been undertaken. Um, and so I suppose it's using the savings that to put it back into the service to benefit the patients themselves who are accessing the service. Mm. Thank you. And another question for you. Um, it's about the statement from the EMA uh, about interchangeability of biosimilars. Has this been implemented in Ireland? And does that mean that prescribers can pres prescribe by INN rather than brand? So I suppose the statement came out last week from the EMA and it's a position statement. It's an EMA position statement in terms of interchangeability. And what they're saying is that if they have, re if they have reviewed 
if let's say take for example adalimumab if they have approved medicines for adalimumab and they've pr approved the reference medicine humira and they have approved the biosimilar medicines and essentially what they're saying is that this decision of the prescriber is to prescribe adalimumab and whether they prescribe a biosimilar or a bi or, or the reference medicine there is no expect there is going to be no clinically meaning difference in terms of quality safety and efficacy and they've always said that the biosimilar medicine is interchangeable with the reference medicine because that's how they license the reference that the, they license the biosimilar medicine. But they've, there's never been any studies to show that one biosimilar version of, for example, adalimumab is directly clinically comparable to another biosimilar version of adalimumab because con companies aren't going to fund phase three studies when their medicine has already been authorized, having done that study against the reference medicine. But the EMA have reviewed all the data that's out there. They've reviewed the scientific data in terms of the quality, safety, and efficacy. And they are saying now that the, the, that the decision is to prescribe adalimumab and what, what version of adalimumab you prescribe after that it doesn't make a difference. So if, you're, if the patient's on a biosimilar and they're having some issue with it, for example, they can switch them to another biosimilar if it's because of the formulation. And we do plan in the coming weeks to write out to the prescribers in rheumatology, dermatology, and gastroenterology to make them aware of this EMA position statement. And hopefully that will be a further impetus to encourage prescribers to look at their patients that remain on Humira and just to, to just consider them for switching to one of the biosimilar medicines. Thanks, Bernard. Um, questions are slowing down. This might be our final one. Um, oh, sorry, we've, we've another one popped in. So, um, so about consenting patients. Um, so previously patients had consent uh, before switching. Is this now removed? Is the consent step removed for interchangeability? Well, I suppose it's, the, the medicines haven't been dignified. So we have to be very careful. There's, a, there's two distinct, there's interchangeability in terms of what the EMA are talking about is where a prescriber makes a decision to switch the patient from a reference medicine to a biosimilar or a biosimilar to a biosimilar. We have, within Irish legislation, we have lists of interchangeable medicines and that's a different thing. And that's where we have, um, the medicines have been deemed interchangeable by the HPRA and pharmacy substitution can happen. But in terms of what the EMA are saying for interchangeability is that they should still, the prescriber can pick a, a version, can pick adalimumab and a particular adalimumab product, be it a biosimilar or the reference medicine, but they will still decide which particular product they will get. The prescriber will make that decision. Thank you. Um, a question about, do you plan to make the managed access program for all drugs fully electronic? This yeah, we would advantage. definitely, we would, um, enjoy it more if everything was um, electronic and online because obviously the admin in terms of paper-based applications coming in and having to communicate back via email but we work really closely with the PCRS and I suppose all of our IT framework is from the PCRS that they put a lot, a lot of time and they have a lot of other things to put IT build into as well. So in general, we join the queue um, and we prioritize our most, um, our biggest projects. So the reason, for example, CGRP maps for, um, for uh, chronic migraine went on was that we really knew the volume was going to be very high there. So we prioritize that for our um, initial IT uh, build. And we really hope to have it for Dupilumab uh, this year, but it just, you know, we have to prioritize. Uh, and we're, we're working with, I suppose, Rivroxman is the next one that will go online. Um, and we th there's also, I suppose, some of the treatments there that you probably are all aware of in terms of weight management, um, the Saxenda, Wygovi, things like that. We know volume potential will be high on those, so we do have to prioritize. But yeah, I think in terms of uh, research tool and being able to follow up and track and communicate with prescribers and make it very clear, uh, the online system is, is better for us. Poor Rosaline has to deal with the paper base to pick them out. And it's, you know, it's, it's a lot more work for everybody involved. So actually the online systems, um, really we'd love to use more of them, yeah. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, a question, what about protac molecules? Um, I don't know what protac molecules are. I, <laughs> I don't know if Bernard does. Bernard. If that person wants to context that question is yeah if you want to, to type in a clarification that would be that would be helpful um as we do that um audrey maybe we could um put in the feedback um link and and pull up our slides about um the next webinar so if you want to clarify please do yes 
stop sharing there. Thanks. So the feedback link has just appeared in in the chat box there. We'd appreciate any feedback that you have about this this webinar and any topics you'd like to see covered in future webinars. Um, a reminder is always um, that hopefully uh, your learning this evening has prompted uh, you to to uh, learn something new and, and hopefully log that in a reflective cycle um, in your ePortfolio. And our next webinar will take place in two weeks time on the 12th of October, and that will focus on endometriosis uh, with Kathleen King and Elaine Bird. Um, so we hope you'll join us for that. So we have lots of thank yous coming into the chat box and, and thank you very much, Sarah Bernard and Rosaline. That was uh, really informative and really going to be very helpful, I think, for, for lots of pharmacists out there. Um, so we thank you for taking the time to put that together and, and delivering the presentation this evening. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording there. Yeah. Thank you.